Section 1 of The Outline of Science, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Abai in January 2011. The Outline of Science, Volume 2 by J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 9 The Wonders of Microscopy. Part 1. The use of a lens for magnifying purposes is ancient, but the first compound microscope was probably made in 1590 by a Dutchman, Zacharias Janssen, whose invention was followed up by Galileo a few years later. But it did not become an effective instrument till towards the middle of the 18th century. In a simple microscope, we look at the object directly through a lens or through several lenses. This kind of instrument is often used for microscopic dissection. But in the compound microscope, we look through an eye lens or ocular at an inverted image of the object formed inside the tube of the instrument by an object lens or objective. In all ordinary microscopes there are two lenses in the eyepiece and three lenses in the objective, and all sorts of ingenious devices have been invented for making the most of the magnifying power without losing clearness and definition. An Invisible World of Life In the early days of microscopy, the instrument was to a large extent a scientific toy. The observers magnified objects and often drew them very beautifully, but without making them more intelligible. There is not much gain in seeing a minute object loom large unless we understand it better. This was a necessary stage. Soon, however, great steps were taken, and one of these may be called the discovery of the invisible world of life. The pioneer explorer was surely the Dutch observer Leuwenhoek, 1632 to 1723, who discovered minute creatures like the rotifers or wheel animalcules, which are common in ponds, and the infusorians, which abound wherever vegetable matter rots away in water. He made numerous microscopes, and though they had neither tube nor mirror, they were sufficient to enable him to demonstrate his animalcules before the Royal Society of London the fellows signing an affidavit that they had seen the little creatures. It was Leuwenhoek also who, in 1687, discovered bacteria, the very minute organisms which cause all putrefaction, are responsible for bringing about many diseases, and are yet of immense service to many living creatures. It was not till long afterwards that Pasteur and others demonstrated the importance of bacteria, but it was a great event in the history of science when Leuwenhoek first proved their presence. It was literally the discovery of a new world with a teeming population, with incalculable powers for good and evil. It must have been a seed in the human mind, this idea of an intense activity going on all unseen until men stuck lenses of glass in front of their own. Another great event, though its importance was not recognized till afterwards, was the discovery of the male elements or spermatozoa of animals, which fertilize the egg cells, so that these may begin to develop. This discovery was probably due, in 1677, to a medical student in Leiden, Louis de Hamen, who showed them to Leuwenhoek, but it was not till more than a hundred years later that the meaning of these sperm cells was recognized. And it is interesting to remember that it was not till 1843 that another medical student, Martin Berry, in Edinburgh, observed for the first time in the rabbit the fertilization of the mammalian ovum by the spermatozoon. In modern times, an extraordinary intensity of research has been focused on the usually microscopic egg cell and the always microscopic sperm cell. In the union of these, an individual animal has its beginning, and it is interesting to trace this modern study, so important in connection with heredity, back and back to the Leiden student's first glimpse of spermatozoa. But we must not lose the wood in the trees. 
one of the real wonders of microscopy rising high above any mere curiosity collecting is the discovery of a world of invisible life there are the bacteria which may be regarded as the simplest of living creatures there are the yeasts and the simple moulds there are the single-celled green plants which play so important a role in the economy of the sea by providing food for humble animals like water fleas there are the one-celled animals or protozoa such as the chalk forming foraminifera the infusorians which often serve as middlemen between the products of bacterial putrefaction and some higher incarnation in crustacean or worm and the death-bringing organisms of malaria and sleeping sickness there are also many-celled animals of microscopic dimensions such as the wheel animalcules of the pond and the minute crustaceans which play so important a part in the circulation of matter by feeding on the microscopic algae and infusorians in the water and being themselves devoured by fishes there are also the invisible early stages of many important parasites whose life history would have remained quite obscure if naturalists had been without microscopes it seems hardly too much to say that the system of animate nature would be uncomfortably magical if the microscope had not enabled us to detect the missing links in many a chain of events the liver fluke which often destroys the farmer's sheep is a relatively large animal about an inch long but it starts its life as microscopic egg which develops into a microscopic larva that enters a water snail and has a remarkable history there the tapeworm with which man becomes infected by eating bad beef imperfectly cooked may be several yards in length but it began as a microscopic egg which was swallowed by a bullock and hatched into a microscopic boring larva which eventually became the beef bladderworm in hundreds of cases the microscope reveals the life history in the course of a few years a very serious bee pest known as isle of wight disease has spread throughout britain causing havoc among the hives and greatly discouraging a lucrative and wholesome industry the nature and meaning of this disease remained baffling until strenuous and patient microscopic work by rennie and white demonstrated that the plague was bound up with the presence of an extremely minute mite in the anterior breathing tubes of the bee and when the cause of a disease is discovered it is not usually long before investigation also reveals a cure intricacy of architecture in small animals long before there was any microscope the use of the scalpel helped sometimes by the simple lens had revealed the intricacies of the body in man and in animals we may save ourselves from exaggerating modern achievements by recalling how much aristotle three hundred eighty four to three hundred twenty two before christ knew of animal structure he dissected many a creature such as the sea urchin he saw the beating of the tiny heart of the unhatched chick he described how the embryo of the smooth dogfish is bound to the wall of its mother's oviduct and much more besides and aristotle had his successors few and far between who kept up the anatomizing tradition long before there was any microscope but what the early microscopists did was to reveal the fact that the multitude of minute creatures which it was hopeless to try to dissect had an intricacy of structure comparable to that in larger and higher animals one of the pioneers in this exploration was the italian marcello malpighi sixteen twenty eight to sixteen ninety four who described the internal architecture of the silkworm as animal had never been described before he worked so hard that he threw himself into a fever and set up inflammation in his eyes Quote, nevertheless in performing these researches so many marvels of nature were spread before my eyes that i experienced an internal pleasure that my pen could not describe End quote. he discovered for instance the delicate branching air tubes or trachea which carry air to every hole and corner of the insect's body 
and it is plain from this instance that he discovered internal structures which made the insect at once more intelligible this sort of discovery we still call the excretory organs of insects malphigian tubes was characteristic of the man and characteristic of a kind of investigation which continues untiringly to the present day it makes for a realization of the unity of organic nature to disclosing creatures which will pass through the eye of a needle the presence of organs comparable to those in man himself much of malpighi's work was done with a simple lens but he had also his microscope with two lenses and in any case his name may be associated with the great discovery that as far as intricacy of structure goes size does not count for much it is a very striking experience to observe a minute animal like the rotifer hydatina not more than a pin prick in size and to find that it has a food canal a chewing apparatus a nerve center various muscles a delicate kidney tube and so on yet it is such a pygmy when all is said there are little beetles trichopterygids well represented in britain which are sometimes only one hundredth of an inch in length practically invisible yet within that small compass there is the same kind of intricacy that is found in a goliath beetle brain and nerves muscles and food canal air tubes and kidney tubes blood and germ cells he would be a bold man who says he quite understands how there is all this intricacy within bulk so small but this we venture to call the second wonder of microscopy that great intricacy of structure may occur in a microscopically minute living body intricacy of vital architecture we have singled out the name of Malpighi in Italy as a pioneer in the exploration of the structure of minute animals, but we might have taken with equal justice Swammerdam in Holland, whose precision of minutiose observation has rarely been equalled. He is memorable not only for his anatomy of small creatures, but, like Malpighi, for his minute anatomy of larger ones and here we might also include the early british microscopists hook and grew for this was another line of advance to disclose the intricacy of vital architecture that lay beyond the limits of scalpel and simple lens thus it was a great step when swammerdam discovered in sixteen fifty eight the blood corpuscles of the frog when Malpighi demonstrated the air cells in the lung where the gases interchange takes place between blood and air when leuwenhoek completed harvey's theory of the circulation of the blood by demonstrating in sixteen eighty the capillary connection between arteries and veins speaking of the tail of the tadpole he said quote, a sight presented itself more delightful than any mine eyes had ever beheld for here i discovered more than fifty circulations of the blood in different places while the animal lay quiet in the water and i could bring it before my microscope to my wish for i saw not only that in many places the blood was conveyed through exceedingly minute vessels from the middle of the tail toward the edges but that each of the vessels had a curve or turning and carried the blood back toward the middle of the tail in order to be again conveyed to the heart End quote such was the momentous observation of the fact that the arteries leading from the heart and the veins leading back to the heart are bound into one system by the intermediation of the capillaries this is an easy illustration of the kind of service microscopy has never ceased to render making vital activity more intelligible by revealing the intricacy of structure for it is in a study of the structure that we get a better understanding of the ways and means of life it is not the whole story of the workshop to know the furnishings and the tools but it is an essential part of the story we hastily draw away our finger from a hot plate a reflex action it is only with the help of the microscope that the physiologist can tell how the message travels by sensory nerve cells to intermediary nerve cells 
and thence to motor nerve cells which command the muscles to move our mouth waters at the sight of palatable food it is only by help of the microscope that the physiologist is able to trace the message from eye to salivary glands and to show how in the cells or unit corpuscles of these glands there is a preparation of secretion which is discharged when the trigger is pulled by a nervous command the study of vital activity requires experiment and chemical analysis but it cannot dispense with the microscope so we venture to say that the third wonder of microscopy is the revelation of the intricacy of minute structure End of section 1of the outline of science volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. read by avai in january two thousand eleven the outline of science volume two by j arthur thompson chapter nine the wonders of microscopy part two the stones and mortar of the house of life it is a long and tangled story which tells us of the gradual discovery of the cells or unit areas of which all but the simplest living creatures are built up and of the living matter or protoplasm which these cells contain or portion off the genius of the short-lived french anatomist bichat had analyzed a living body into a web of tissues nervous muscular glandular connective and epithelial but to schwann and schleiden virchow and gutzer is due the credit of a further advance the cell theory certainly one of the triumphs of microscopes with brains behind them the cell theory or cell doctrine states three facts one that all plants and animals have a cellular structure being either single cells or combinations of numerous cells two that every living creature reproduced in the ordinary way begins its life as a single cell and if it does not remain at that humble level proceeds to build up a body by the division and redivision of cells which eventually form tissues and organs and three that the activities of a many-celled organism are the coordinated summation of the activities of the component cells every animal virchow said appears as a sum of vital units not that we are to think of an ordinary animal as a colony of cells as a mob is a collection of angry men or even as a battalion is a coordination of disciplined soldiers it is nearer the truth to think of the fertilized egg cell a potential organism when we come to think of it dividing and redividing into cells so that the unified business of life may be more effectively carried on by division of labor as one of the greatest of botanists said it is not that the cells form the plant it is rather that the plant makes the cells the microcosm of the cell notably aristotle the early naturalists were content to study the outsides of animals like hearts and lungs bichat marks the deeper penetration to the tissues that make up the organs then came the recognition of the cells that compose the tissues finally there was the recognition of protoplasm which huxley called the physical basis of life it may be useful to place the different levels of study in a clear scheme the old picture of a cell was that of a little drop of living matter with a kernel or nucleus and sometimes with an enclosing wall but the revelations of the microscope have made this picture obsolete we have to think of a more or less unified minute area of great chemical diversity with complex particles and unmixing droplets restlessly moving in a fluid in the centre of this whirlpool with its flotsam of reserve products and waste products there floats the nucleus a little world in itself 
inside its membrane through which materials are ever permeating out and in there are readily stainable nuclear bodies or chromosomes usually a definite number for each species and each chromosome is built up of bead-like microsomes strung on a transparent ribbon it begins to make one's head real cell nucleus chromosomes microsomes but it is all fact inside the nucleus there may be a nucleolus or more than one and outside the nucleus there is a minute body called the centrosome which plays an important part in the division of the cell this is not nearly all but it is enough to suggest how complex is the microcosm of the cell inside each of man's cells there are about two dozen chromosomes and one of the authorities on cell lore speaks of each chromosome having the corporate individuality of a regiment the really indivisible living units being the beads or microsomes which correspond to the man and to this must of course be added the fact that we have many millions of these cells in our body indeed we are fearfully and wonderfully made the beginning of the individual every many-celled creature which reproduces in the ordinary way starts on the journey of life as a single cell the fertilized ovum as we have made clear in a previous article the usually microscopic fertilized egg cell contains in some way that we cannot picture the initiatives or factors for the hereditary characters of the living creature in question but the microscope has begun to reveal the little world within the egg cell and it has been found possible to map out the way in which the factors for certain characters are disposed in the chromosomes thus in the case of the egg of the fruit fly called drosophila it is possible to say that the hereditary or germinal factor for say red eye or gray wing lies at such and such a level in one of the four chromosomes it would be difficult to find a wonder of microscopy greater than this yet this is but an instance of what goes on at a level of visibility which only the microscope can reach we know much in regard to the permutations and combinations which take place when the germ cell is ripening shufflings of the hereditary cards which throw some light on the origin of new departures we know something of the manner in which the paternal and maternal hereditary contributions behave in relation to one another when and after fertilization takes place we know much in regard to the sequence of events in individual development wherein the obviously complex emerges from the apparently simple and the implicit inheritance becomes an explicit individual in the seventeenth century william harvey the discoverer of the circulation of the blood wrote in regard to development Quote, although it be a known thing subscribed by all that the fetus assumes its original and birth from the male and female and consequently that the egg is produced by the cock and hen and the chicken out of the egg yet neither the schools of physicians nor aristotle's discerning brain have disclosed the manner how the cock and its seed doth mint and coin the chicken out of the egg End quote but although we do not understand today how the factors of an inheritance are condensed into the dimensions of a pinprick or how the fertilized egg cell segments into two and cleavage after cleavage continues with associated division of labor until an embryo is built up we do know why it is that like tends to beget like why certain hereditary characters are distributed in a particular way among the offspring and we also know the successive steps by which the process of development is accomplished it is this kind of knowledge we think which must be regarded as the crowning wonder of microscopy these fundamental questions of heredity and development will be discussed in a separate article but the point here is that the scientific study of inheritance can as little disperse with microscopy as with breeding experiments and statistics all three are essential manifold uses of the microscope 
everyone knows that fingerprints are sometimes of critical importance in the identification of a criminal. The details of the pattern of the ridges on the fingers vary from man to man. They are individual. Therefore, if a good impression is available on some surface which has been handled in the course of a burglary, let us say, it can be compared with the collection in the album of criminals' fingerprints, and identification may follow. The microscope has even subtler use in the detection of crime. If splashes of blood on the clothes of a suspected murder are declared by him to be due to the blood of a rabbit which he killed, it is usually possible to test the truth of his statement microscopically. For the dimensions of the very minute red blood corpuscles differ in different mammals, and the circular shape in all mammals, except camels, can be distinguished at a glance from the elliptical shape in all the other backboned animals. Moreover, the red blood pigment of hemoglobin can be easily made to assume a crystalline form, and it is a very remarkable fact that the blood crystals of the horse can be distinguished microscopically from those of the ass, and even those of the domestic dog from those of the wild Australian dingo. Poisons that crystallize may also be detected by means of the microscope. The use of the microscope in medicine may be illustrated in reference to the blood. For it is often possible by microscopically examining a film of blood spread on a slide to tell what is wrong with the patient. Microscopic parasites may be detected, like those of malaria, methods of counting the red blood corpuscles, man has trillions, may show that they are far below the proper number and the change in the normal shape of the hemoglobin crystals may show that something is amiss. It is unnecessary to dwell on the medical importance of the microscope in determining the presence or absence of certain kinds of microbes and higher parasites in the blood or food canal of the patient. Along with this physiological utilization of the microscope, we may take its use in testing drinking water, which is liable to be fouled by the presence of bacteria and various minute animals. Also of great importance is the microscopic study of milk, for this fluid is peculiarly liable to contamination and is very suitable for the growth of various kinds of disease germs. For the detection of adulteration, the microscope is also invaluable. The starch grains of different plants, such as potato, wheat, rice, mice, are readily distinguished from one another, and a microscopic examination may immediately prove that a commodity sold under a particular name, for example as arrowroot, is not what it professes to be. If a sample of so-called honey contains no pollen grains, but a great many starch grains, we may be sure that the busy bee was not the chief agent in its production. In short, the microscope is a valuable detective of dishonesty. But the use of the microscope more important and more pleasant to think of is in metallurgy, where its utilization to detect the structural features of the stable and the transient in various metallurgical combinations, such as different kinds of steel, has been of inestimable importance. A farmer can always make good use of a lens in examining samples of seeds, or in identifying particular kinds of injurious insects, or in detecting the beginnings of rusts and mildews on his crops. But the expert agriculturist must of course go much further, especially in warm countries, where the microscope is necessary for the study of the insidious fungi which are always ready to find a weak spot in the plant's defenses in all sorts of plantations, from coffee to rubber. The Ultramicroscope Early in the 20th century, an ingenious method was described by Siedentopf and Sigmondi, which is often briefly referred to as the Ultramicroscope. Everyone knows from personal observation that a strong beam of sunlight entering a darkened room reveals a multitude of dust particles, which are not seen at all in ordinary light. The same multitude of particles is often seen in the track of a strong beam from a magic lantern in a darkened room. 
these dancing particles, whose abundance we scarcely suspected, become visible because they are so strongly illuminated. There is a diffraction of rays from their surface, and they look much bigger than they really are. In 1899, Lord Rayleigh pointed out that a particle too small to be seen by the highest power of the microscope under ordinary conditions might be made visible if it received sufficiently intense illumination, and the ultramicroscope took advantage of this idea. It occurred to Siedentopf and Sigmondi that if the particles in a solution could be strongly illuminated by a beam coming in, so to speak, sideways, then particles ordinarily invisible might stand out. Their diffraction images, at any rate, would be seen. In ordinary microscopic conditions, the beam of light is thrown by the mirror, usually through a substage condenser, directly through the solution or thin transparent section, up into the tube of the microscope, where an image is formed, to be reformed by the eyepiece. In the ultramicroscope for examining solutions, the beam of light is projected horizontally into the solution and examined from above. The result is that particles ordinarily invisible are seen in a vigorous dance, the so-called Brownian movement. This dance is due to the particles being bombarded by the moving molecules of the fluid in which they are suspended. By accessory devices, it becomes possible, in the use of the ultramicroscope, to count the number of particles in a solution and to measure the mass of each. This has formed the basis of exceedingly interesting conclusions, which are unfortunately beyond our scope in this article. A reference should be added, however, to another method called dark ground illumination, which makes structures visible which are invisible in ordinary conditions of microscopic work. Professor Bayliss writes, quote, The central rays of the illuminating beam are cut out by means of a stop, and the peripheral rays are reflected by a parabolic surface so as to meet in a point in the object under examination. They cross at such an angle as to pass outside the field of the objective in use, which only picks up the light refracted or diffracted from structures in the preparation. End quote. The dark ground illumination brings out features which are invisible in the ordinary direct illumination. The essential parts of a microscope are, as we have seen, 1. The objective for obtaining the first magnified image of the object. 2. The ocular for further enlarging that image and transmitting it to the observer's eye, and 3. The substage condenser for illuminating the object with a cone of light. Now, in modern times, there have been numerous detailed improvements in these parts, for example in the quality of the glass used in making the lenses, and the present-day microscope is certainly a very perfect instrument. Indeed, unless some new idea is discovered, such as those behind the ultramicroscope and dark ground illumination, it does not seem likely that great advances in technical microscopy can be made. The reason for this statement is to be found in the optical limitations of the instrument. The use of the microscope is not mainly magnification, but resolution. By resolution, says Mr. J. E. Barnard, is made the power the objective has of separating and forming correct images of fine detail. Unless we see more of the intimate structure, the magnification in itself does not greatly avail. It does not help us to understand the thing better. Now, there are two factors that determine this resolving power of the microscope. The first is what is called the numerical aperture of the lens, which means, in a general way, the number of divergent rays of light that the curvature of the lens will allow to impinge upon it. Lenses of high magnifying power are so small that they admit only a very small beam of light. Thus, what is gained in magnifying power may be lost because of deficient illumination. 
a pretty device to increase the income of light in these high power lenses was the immersion lens made of such a curvature that when the lens was focused down into a drop of oil or some other liquid placed over the object on the slide it received light from all sides the drop into which the lens is focused down or immersed greatly increases the illumination of a lens with high magnifying power this method has enhanced the value of the microscope as an instrument that analyzes structure or in other words that discloses the intimate architecture of things but the main point is that the numerical aperture of even the oil immersion objective has at the present time reached its practical limit yet there is a second factor and that is the wavelength of the light rays that impinge from the mirror and condenser on the object on the slide but here again there is a limit for as professor bayliss tersely puts it quote, any object smaller than half the wavelength of the light by which it is illuminated cannot be seen in its true form and size owing to diffraction hereby is set a limit to microscopic observation End quote. These are difficult matters, but the important point is that there are practical limits to what the microscope can do in the way of magnification and resolution. But Mr. J. E. Barnard has recently made an interesting step forward by using an illuminant such as a mercury vapor lamp, which is rich in blue and violet radiations. It may also be practicable to utilize invisible radiations in the ultraviolet, which would further increase the microscope's resolving power. As things are at present, the limit of useful magnification is somewhere about 800 diameters. Beauty of Microscopic Structure We cannot close this article without referring to a very different subject, namely, the extraordinary beauty of many microscopic objects. There are endless beauty feasts to be found in the architecture of the shells of diatoms, foraminifera, and radiolarians, in the structure of the outside of pollen grains and butterflies' eggs, in the zoned internal structure of the stems of plants and the spines of sea urchins, in the sculpturing of the scales on butterflies' wings and the multitudinous hexagons of their eyes, in the strange hairs on many a leaf and the elegant branching of zoophytes, in the intricate section of a rock and the variety of snow crystals. Of microscopic beauty there is no end. End of section 2